Hello, I'm Olivia Kui with a special edition of The Big Story. I'm joined by Minister for the Environment and Water Resources, Masagos Zokifli. Mr. Masagos is also the head of the SG Clean Task Force, which was set up in early March. Welcome, Minister. Thank you so much for taking the time. Hello, Olivia. Hi. So, Minister, the last time you were on the show, it was an in-depth, wide-ranging panel discussion on cleanliness in a time of COVID-19. This is something we'll touch on later. That panel, though, was just over a month ago, and things evolved very quickly in these unusual times. Since then, we've seen the circuit breaker put in place. Then, most recently, on Tuesday, it was extended until June the 1st. Most of you are working from home, and non-essential businesses and schools are closed. But just Despite frequent calls for the public to stay at home and to act sensibly, some are still not taking safe distancing seriously. So let's begin our conversation there, Minister. You give yes. a daily update on the number of people who were fined for breaching circuit breaker rules as well as those caught without a mask while out. What do you make of the numbers? Are you surprised, disappointed even, that there are still people not abiding by safe distancing and other measures? Well, I'll say that uh, most people are staying home, mm -hmm. but um, those who have been issuing fines for violating safety distancing measures, they, are, they fall into three categories. They are the don't know, don't care, or the defiant. And uh, unfortunately, the, the number who are defiant, uh, for them, we have to even call the police to ensure that the safety of our enforcement officers are not uh, threatened. Right. Minister, if the number of those who are still flouting the rules doesn't come down, do you believe the $300 fine for first offences should be increased? Well, I'd want to get there. I think most mm. importantly, we keep exhorting uh, our uh, society to basically stay home. And by and large, when we have uh, reduced the number of essential services, as well as uh, closing the uh, car parks to our uh, national parks, uh, these uh, measures have uh, helped to bring down the numbers of people going out and therefore consequently the number of people who will be violating uh, the measures. Right. Well, several of those uh, violating the measures are the elderly. Why do you think this particular group is having difficulty adapting to the circuit breaker? Well, I can understand that many of these elderly may feel cooped up at home. Uh, most, of, most of these all the time before these uh, COVID-19 measures took place, they've been, been free to go out uh, anywhere around the neighborhood, meet friends, even sit alone in the, in the park. But today, uh, and, and uh, for the days that uh, until 1st of June, we are telling everybody to stay home. And uh, I think loneliness is a, a little bit difficult to cope, but it is, there are things that they can do. And uh, we are also outreaching to this group with uh, MSF uh, to uh, understand what is uh, uh, bugging them at home and what we can do to basically help them stay at home. Right. So from the elderly, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. It was reported on Wednesday that six youths were fined for breaking safe distancing measures. Do you believe they are the, ex uh, the exception rather than the norm? How have younger people adapted to it actually? Well, whether you're old or young, you should be staying home. And I think if you try to try to go out to basically break the curfew, uh, you think it is fun, well, inevitably, it may come to uh, you being infected by the diseases or passing on to your friends. I think this is something you don't want to do. We have to get our youth to realize uh, their, their uh, irrational, uh, acts of defiance or act of uh, trying to push the uh, the uh, pressure to meet each other it will also inevitably cause uh, the disease to be uh, uh, spread among themselves and then mm -hmm. to their loved ones and the consequence will be unbearable. Right. Well, safe distancing enforcement officers have been deployed for several weeks now. Do you think these EOs and ambassadors could actually be weak links as well? What precautions do they take in terms of protection and distancing? Well, we, we brief our EOs daily to make sure mm -hmm. that if there are lapses uh, or sometimes misunderstanding of what they need to do or how they should be going about their work, uh, they get briefed properly. Uh, we, we are also happy that uh, uh, the public do feedback to us when these lapses happen. You know, we are human. 
um, and this has not this is not the kind of job they do uh, as part of their job description and uh, they are deployed being deployed on uh, on the ground uh, and learning as as the uh, situation evolves but in any case i think they are doing a good job and their presence uh, well understood and well accepted by the society and many of them are being treated with respect mm. well the police said they've seen a rise in the number of abuse cases to some 3,000 of these are EOs and ambassadors. Why do you think these officers and ambassadors are met with such abuse? Well, I think in our society, like I mentioned, the third bucket, the people who uh, are defiant will always be in society. And for this group of people, we warn them that uh, we will bear on them the full extent of law if yes. they will become violent to our EOs. Uh, but more importantly, the rest of the uh, people who are violated are, are, are those who sometimes don't know what are the new measures are being put today or the next day. And then there are people also who don't care, but when, when you approach them, uh, they, they, they comply. Right. Well, when it comes to these matters, uh, Muir uh, takes a zero-tolerance approach. There are a number of penalties for causing hurt to EOs and ambassadors, including a jail term of up to seven years, a fine and a caning. Minister, should punishments be made more severe if instances of abuse keep occurring? Well, we have been uh, asking the justice system to ensure that uh, the punishment being meted out are uh, 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 done in a balanced way, whether it's to, to ensure that deterrence, to ensure that the people who are being abused are also feeling that justice has been meted out. So we leave it to the justice system to do that. But at the end of the day, it's all up to us to keep our tempers down. Everyone is going through this problem together. And I know that staying at home, being cooped up, is a very difficult uh, situation to, to uh, cope with. But uh, let's uh, we just uh, hunker down together. This is something we do together. Nobody is special. Nobody has special treatment. So if we just uh, tolerate this, we hope that uh, this will go away uh, as soon as we can uh, see the improvements take place. Mm. Right, let's hope for that as well. So, yes. the weight of your ministry's responsibilities is growing from crowding in parks to so keeping an eye out for a safe distancing deviance. And uh, the Ministry of the Environment and Water Resources may have more in its periphery in the near future with the evolving rules under the circuit breaker. So, Minister, how are you coping with the heavier, thicker portfolio? Well, we are a good team. Everyone knows uh, and uh, what they're supposed to, to do and the purpose of their work. Everyone understands that uh, by putting in uh, their, their part, we can uh, ensure that the circuit breaker measures are being observed by everybody and that those very few who are on the road uh, know that uh, we will deal with them and that uh, they should not be defying the law. Hmm. Well, some people say the extension of the circuit breaker is not just about community spread numbers, but also about breaking people's bad habits and forming new ones for the long term. What do you think? How true is that? Well, firstly, we, we extended and also increased, tightened the uh, safe distancing measures, basically to bring down the number of interactions in society even further. We have seen the numbers of infection in society stabilizing, but that's not good enough because there is always this cluster moving around invisibly. We don't know where they are, who they are. Therefore, the best way to do this is to ensure even more people stay home. And that's what we are trying to achieve. So we hope that uh, like we see in many other countries, when the numbers go down to single digit or even zero, we can slowly lift the restrictions and then go back to normal. I think mm. this is the, the message we are giving, giving to people. We are not there to uh, uh, curb people's freedom. We are there to ensure that all of us come out of this alive and healthy. Right. Well, Minister Masagos, it's been slightly more than two months since the SG Clean campaign was launched. The SG Clean Task Force was announced on March the 6th. What inroads have both the campaign and task force made since then in raising hygiene standards across Singapore? What examples can you give us? Well, I, I'm, I'm happy that uh, many people now understand the need for better hygiene. Not only because good hygiene is good for us, but uh, we have to always be ready for new different kind of crisis in uh, decades ahead.
So I'm glad that uh, in the in the road to putting better hygiene standards, I've got uh, very good feedback, even uh, embra uh, stakeholders embracing these measures. One of the things we will see now very visibly is that uh, all our uh, stallholders, FMB operators are putting on masks. And that's uh, going forward, this is something we want to make permanent. Mm. Uh, and we want to uh, ensure that this will be uh, complied to uh, very rigorously. And even now, we have been asking everybody to make sure they put their mask on when they're handling food. And if they don't, we will uh, find them. Right. So you touched on this earlier, I guess, um, making certain measures uh, more permanent, like you know, hawkers and people in the F&B industry wearing masks. So when it comes to ingrading the importance of personal and uh, public hygiene practices, do you think this mindset will last even after uh, the COVID-19 outbreak? Uh, well, we, we, we know we have to do what we can do in terms of enforcement is at the cleaning companies. We have uh, imposed standards, higher standards and, and frequency of cleaning on these companies. And we will maintain this beyond the COVID period. But like you, like you mentioned, the real, uh, uh, the, what, who really matters are ourselves, uh, whether we can change our habit mm. in using these public uh, places like toilets and uh, hawker centers and so forth. I'm happy that the schools have made great inroads, uh, made, made great improvements to inculcate good habits for, to their children. Uh, but um, I'm hopeful that uh, most of us understand the need for better hygiene and, and improve our uh, own habits in uh, using uh, public facilities like uh, hawker centres and toilets. Well, Mr. Masagos, you're also Minister in Charge of Muslim Affairs. Now that the circuit breaker has been extended until June the 1st, it affects the entire Ramadan period, which begins today, as well as Hari Raya festivities on May 24th. What was the community's reaction to the measures, especially the unprecedented step to close mosques? I'm very happy that uh, our religious uh, sector, the religious scholars, have, uh, are always aligned and understand the need to uh, issue instructions and guidance based on medically sound advice. And uh, very much earlier on, even before other countries uh, in, uh, effected the closure of mosques, uh, scholars in Singapore agreed unanimously to do so ahead of everybody else. And mm. uh, for the Ramadan and also for the uh, coming up Hari Raya, the same guidance has been given uh, by the same group of uh, scholars, very respected in the society, and that's uh, calling our community basically to adapt and to also do our part to contribute towards the safe distancing that we have to implement uh, for the safety of everybody else. Has the spirit or the mood of Hari Raya also changed with the cancellation of the iconic Geylang Sarai Bazaar this year? Of course, of course. These are the things we all in yes. Singapore look forward to, you know, yes. I think when I go to Geylang Bazaar, it's not just uh, Muslims and young, but uh, everybody, old and young and uh, even our non-Muslim friends. Exactly, uh, I have been yeah, there myself. Enjoy it. Yes, and you get the, guest, the best kind of food and different kind of food during this time. Uh, so we have to adapt and uh, some of these uh, bazaar owners have now put their goods on uh, e-platform. And uh, they, they are, if, they are, uh, if they are not constrained in the delivery of these uh, goods, um, we can certainly still participate in some form of uh, bazaar shopping, mm -hmm. but in a different kind of bazaar. Right. So how do you feel about your own Hari Raya plans being disrupted, Minister? Well, the most important thing is that I have to make sure my mom understands that uh, I shouldn't be visiting her and that uh, we will do our uh, usual uh, greetings uh, via video. Uh, she's getting used to it, uh, but uh, you know, old people, uh, they, have very, uh, ha they have very strong habits. It's hard to change, but I'm, I'm glad uh, she, she understands. The same mm -hmm. thing goes for everybody. So I hope we know, we know that everybody's adjusting. Everybody needs to accept this new norm and uh, I'm sure that, uh, and I hope that this is the only time we ever have to do this. Yeah, here's hoping. Well, churches in Singapore are streaming their masses and services online. How have mosques and other Malay Muslim organisa uh, organizations reached out to the community to offer assistance during this uh, difficult period? 
Indeed, uh, our uh, the Muis uh, Muslim uh, Religious Council has uh, put together a number of uh, online uh, packages to help the community cope with the uh, uh, the, the uh, changes that we have to make in our life. For example, online donations, uh, online lessons, uh, even uh, getting food delivered to the uh, those recipients of uh, zakat, which are the needy. So all these kind of things uh, are being, have been put together, uh, not only by MUIS, but also by uh, many stakeholders in our community, including the uh, uh, Malay chambers, uh, the uh, uh, various Malay Muslim organizations, all coming together in the spirit of Kotong Royong to help mm -hmm. us cope with this period. Right, Minister, before we wrap up this uh, conversation. Do you have a message for those in the Malay Muslim community here as they observe the fasting month? Well, my, my message to, to everybody uh, observing the Ramadan is simply this. We should be really be uh, thankful that our country, by and large, have got through this uh, period of crisis uh, well, and we will together get out of this. During the Ramadan, the most important thing is to observe uh, fasting as well as to give alms to the poor. This is the fundamental uh, acts of uh, worship in Ramadan. Beyond that, we have to adapt and adjust to the new norm and uh, take the opportunity to pray with our families at home and build good relationships going forward. Well, those are great parting words minister it's been an thank absolute you. pleasure talking with you thank you so much for your time and for your thank insight you. as well thank you keep safe you too i've been speaking to environment and water resources minister mazagos zukifli who's also the head of the sg clean task force this has been a special edition of the big story we come to you every weekday at 5 30 p.m i'm olivia quay thanks for watching and stay safe